Good evening, everyone. My name is Mike Wally. I'm a partner with Eisner Amper, an accounting firm here in New York. We have offices in New Jersey and Cayman Islands and also in San Francisco. We have about 1,400 people in our firm, uh, about 800 right here in New York City. Uh, I'm an SEC partner for the firm. I do audits for publicly traded companies and also for privately owned companies, in dealing primarily in life sciences uh, area. And uh, a little bit more about myself, I've been with the firm for 12 years and in, in the industry for 17. One of the key things I'm, I'm capable of doing in terms of uh, the audit practice is working with small startup companies and taking them public. And I've done that on a, a cancer research uh, drug and I'm working on uh, medical devices which are publicly traded companies already. So that is my forte in, uh, in what I do. Hi, I'm Paul Hughes. I'm with Wigan & Dana, partner uh, in the corporate group. Uh, specifically, I practice in what we call our emerging companies practice, and that's working with companies from sort of a single inventor or a founder with an idea up through uh, high-growth public companies. Um, work across a number of sectors uh, uh, in the technology area, software, uh, medical devices, life sciences, uh, large and small pharma. Um, also, uh, uh, software-enabled services, uh, particularly in the healthcare area. Um, and uh, I personally am a transactional lawyer, so I work on financing, so that's uh, equity, debt, once you qualify. Um, I do mergers and acquisitions, and I do licensing transactions, both in and out licensing. So I'll let Scott tell you a little bit about the firm. Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Scott Kaufman, also a corporate partner at Wigan & Dana. Uh, my practice is a lot like Paul's, represent um, a lot of startup companies from, uh, from the beginning, formation, all the way up through uh, their uh, public offerings and uh, their exits, M&A activities. Um, a couple weeks ago, we just uh, signed up an M&A deal for a $2 billion company. Um, so work with both uh, life science companies as well as uh, regular tech companies. Um, uh, we, our firm uh, also you know, highly valued startup companies. Uh, we've got offices in New York, principal offices in New York City, uh, Stanford and New Haven, uh, particular emphasis on uh, life science and biotech companies, uh, but represent uh, companies all shapes and sizes. So let's, uh, let's get going. Um, so just by a show of hands, has anybody here ever started a company before? Okay. Two. And uh, anybody work for a startup company? Okay. And, uh, or invest in a startup company. Okay, good. So, so we, we were prepared to kind of talk at a very high level to kind of get you some, uh, so, some, some basic information about understanding the legal and accounting and tax issues that face startup companies. Um, so one of, the, one of the principal issues is, you know, what, why do you even need an entity? Uh, and when, when do you actually uh, start it? When do you form it? And the key time to think about that is when you're actually going to be interacting with some type of third party, whether it's funding, if you're going to be raising equity or borrowing money, if you're going to be entering into any kind of contractual relationship, whether it's with an employee, a consultant, uh, hiring people to, uh, to, to work with you. And so the, the idea of creating an entity is to create a shield between your own personal assets and uh, the company's assets to protect yourself. Uh, that th there are other other aspects of uh, and benefits of, of having a, having an entity, but you know one of the principal principal reasons is uh, protection, limited liability. So um, we'll be talking today about corporations and limited liability companies primarily. Um, w one of the interesting stories I came across, I um, I was reading this uh, Steve Jobs book uh, recently, and I don't know if, how many people know, but Apple actually had three founders originally. Uh, Everyone knows about Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, but there was a guy named Ron Wayne who was an engineer um, at Atari where Steve Jobs had been working. And apparently he was the third partner. He got 10% of the company, but they originally formed it as a general partnership. So there were three of them. Uh, both Wozniak and Jobs didn't have any assets. They didn't really care much, but apparently this guy, Ron Wayne, had some assets. I think the book said he had some gold coins that he kept under his mattress and was actually worried about losing uh, because they didn't create a corporation or an, uh, at that time they didn't have limited liability companies. They just created a partnership and in a general partnership, 
the partners are responsible for the debts and obligations of the of the actual partnership. So he was he was concerned about the company going out and spending money and borrowing money and being liable. And after about 10 or 11 days, he, he decided he had enough and he wanted out. So he, he got, I think it was like $2,300 for his 10% interest, which I think uh, would have been worth about $2.5 billion or something at the end of 2010, probably double that by now. So um, it, it, it really kind of emphasized, you know, had he had, and, and they didn't have a lawyer back then, he kind of wrote up this partnership agreement himself. And, but if it would have been advised that you know, there was a way to do it where you wouldn't have your personal assets on the line by setting up an entity, you know, then at that point maybe he would have uh, stayed on. So, so it's, it's kind of the idea of having an entity to, inter to protect yourself is, is very uh, kind of central concept to, um, uh, to protecting yourself. Yeah, so actually just a, one housekeeping thing that we forgot to mention. Um, is given sort of the size of the crowd and, and the way we're set up, we'll, we'll be up here the whole time, the three of us, um, sort of uh, switching back and forth. We're gonna cover things in what we think is a logical uh, order from sort of start of the company through kind of early operations. Um, but to the extent you guys have any questions, we'll have Q&A time at the end. We've reserved some, assuming we don't talk too much. Um, but we're happy to take uh, all, all of us questions during and for sure, based on the show of hands um, that, that Scott had, if we're talking about something and you don't know what it is, my guess is somebody else doesn't know what it is either. So feel free to, to throw a hand up and we'll answer questions. And if it's something that's sort of too detailed, we'll sa save it for later. So um, with that said, so Scott was talking about, yeah, the, the sort of when do you create this thing? And there, there are different sort of reasons to do it. And when those things come up, that's when you do it. So, so Scott talked about the shield. Um, the other thing is you should think about the company as really a repository for value. The easiest thing to think about, particularly with your guys' focus, is IP. So your invention. Is it a patent, know-how, um, that sort of thing. And so what, what you, what you want to do, obviously, the, the, the whole sort of endeavor is clearly to sort of create what you want to create, cure what you want to cure. Uh, but ultimately to make some money also, right? And so to do that, you need a thing, an entity, an LLC, a corporation, what have you, to deposit the, uh, the, the value in. As I said, the easy thing to think about is a patent. So you've, you've filed for it. Maybe you don't have a company. It's filed in your own name. Um, at, at some point, you'll want to think about putting that into a company. Now, there's different ways to do that. You can assign it right in. Company owns it. Um, that's going to... Uh, uh, be very favorable to an investor, they're gonna like that. You need to think about what that IP is, what it's used to the company is, what the value to the investor is gonna be. You might also consider if it's something that has value in multiple verticals, maybe there's a life science aspect to it, but there's also something outside of life sciences that you could do with it, measuring flows in, a, in a, an oil field, excuse me, oil field or something. And so you might say, okay, we're gonna start a company and it's around uh, this technology for a life science application, and I'm going to license it in, but I'm going to retain rights in the other field. So just, again, we're not going to get too detailed in how you do that, but the, the, uh, the point of the example is to say you, you should think about the company and its relationships and contractual relationships with the IP as creating value. Um, the other thing, it's not just IP. Really, as you go out and you form relationships, create a board, uh, sign up people to work for you, that kind of thing. It may not be creating IP as in patents, protectable, um, but it's know-how. It's relationships that have value. It's your network. And to the extent you can put that into something, the company, you can start uh, adding value for the future. Um, the other reason to do it is to formalize relationships. So this, and a lot of what we're going to talk about today is sort of the move from kind of individual inventor, idea person, maybe two people at the bench with an idea toward becoming startup founders and really starting to formalize your relationships, entering into contracts with third parties, not just from a kind of protection from, uh, from liability standpoint, but, but from a value building standpoint. So with that said, uh, we'll, we'll assume you're ready to start an entity and Mike will talk about what type of entity. Well, you have a number of choices on what kind of entity you're looking to start up and also it really comes down to is uh, uh, what are you looking to protect? Uh, and, and how you structure your, your entity goes a long way in terms of exit strategy. Uh, so we'll talk about a C-Corp first, because that's your classic corporation. 
you're a shareholder there, you issue stock. The couple of negative things about that is uh, you lock up any losses in the early years. You cannot distribute them and they essentially stay within the, within the uh, corporation. Another area is double taxation. If you do happen to have profits, you get taxed at the corporate level, and then if you distribute it via uh, a dividend, you get taxed again at the individual level. So there is that negative connotation. You have the opportunity to elect under the subchapter S section of the uh, IRS code to elect to be treated as if you're a partnership, but you still get to keep the, uh, the, the protection for limited liability just f from what you invest into the corporation. The S Corp chapter, subchapter sub S, uh, is, a, is a unique area within the tax code as it relates to corporations. Um, just a few things to understand about it. Uh, federal and state generally accept it. New York City, however, does not recognize the S, S, uh, S Corp election, so you would end up paying based on New York State corporate rates. It's not terrible. Uh, in, in the early years when you have losses or you have small income, you pay basically the state minimum. Uh, but once you reach a certain threshold, you end up getting at the, at the normal uh, corporate rates for uh, New York City. LLCs are a, a, a recently new addition, meaning in the, within the last 10 or 15 years, to take the benefits of a partnership for the pass-through of all your losses and income yet you still retain the protection of a corporation in limiting the liability. And how that's done is, is, is by uh, the, the income and losses are taxed at your level. They pass through the corporation. Uh, you, you don't pay taxes at the corporate level. And on the individual, it comes, comes across. Uh, one of the areas you have to be concerned with is you may be subject to FICA, which is self-employment income, on those, on those wages or uh, that income. Uh, there's a unique area within uh, LLCs uh, that are, are, are consistent with, or I'm sure to say, consistent with uh, the, the use of uh, incentives for employees. In a typical uh, corporation, you issue incentive stock options or non-qualified stock options to incentivize your employees to uh, want to stay there and work and, and get the benefits of what they're, they're putting into the company. In an LLC, you cannot issue stock options. What you can do is intru interest, uh, issue profit interests, and they differ than members' interests. Members' interests is, is essentially me contributing money or capital into the company in exchange for a membership interest, in which I'm, I'm entitled to profits and losses and also ultimately shares of if the company is, is disposed of. Profits interest is given to an employee and he gets invest, he or she gets the benefits of the outcome of the operations of the company in any given year. They do not participate in any of the past history, and they can, in certain circumstances, get uh, some appreciation if you happen to sell your company. By way of an example, I come in and I'm an employee, and my two colleagues up here are owners they give me a 10% profit sharing interest in the company. Everything to the date I joined remain, retained with them. In the intervening year, if they earn $100 interest, I would get $10 to me. If they happen to sell the next day, I would get 10% of that sale if it's written into the agreement. The, an LLC agreement you can actually create within your profit interest, you can carve out that I don't participate in the sale of the company. It's basically a blank slate and you can create however way you want to distribute those assets and liabilities. So it's, it's something that is akin to an, a stock option, however you have a lot more flexibility. <clears throat> One of the benefits of an LLC is you can always convert to a C-Corp, which is typically the strategy when uh, either capital, uh, private equity comes in with, uh, or venture capital or an angel. That's the flexibility and what that does is it allows you as a, in an LLC that you yourself get all the benefits of the losses, presumably in a startup company, that flow to you on a tax return and you can take it personally and it, it stays with you. And at the time you convert to an LLC when the money comes in, then any, any losses stay within a company. And that is highly desirable from the, uh, uh, the uh, 
venture capital people because what they want to do is um, get, a, get an organization that they can control. Effectively, as an LLC, you control it. But when you switch to a corporation, now you have investors, board, management team. So they, they're going to control how the company goes. You'll have a say in it, but you're going to give up a percentage <coughs> ownership. Sure. So the carry forward in both the C Corp and the LLC is, is there. The carry forward, because that's a huge well, incentive, right, to be able to, to write. There's no carry forward on an LLC. There is none. It goes right to you on a personal return. Oh, you're taking yeah. it as you go along. But the individual person could. And, and is it this sort of five-year? No, it it's actually goes right into your return. It's not, it's not a capital loss where it's subject to 3000 or anything so like that. If I invest a million dollars in my business and it, it just tanks, I lose everything, I can essentially take that as a carry forward. It goes to my, as a loss. It goes dollars. right onto your personal return, yes. That's the benefit of that. There are certain investors that do not like to have a C Corp, I mean an LLC start up, set up. They prefer that you set up as a C Corp. And again, that really, going back to my initial statement, is is it beneficial for you in a choice of entity when you establish it, where you think you're going to be and who your target audience is for borrowing money or the next people coming in? Yeah, I, I would just add, on, on Paul may, may add a couple things. Um, when you're thinking about which, you know, we, we get these questions all the time, should we set up as a corporation, should we set up as a limited liability company? You know, it really comes down to what your plans are um, in the near term and long term. Um, you know, if, if, if you have a, a company or a business that's, that's you know, essentially ready to go, you expect to bring in employees, um, you're going to be going to raise capital in the near term, you know, you may want to think about a corporation. You know, the investors who, who invest in those type of businesses aren't as concerned about preserve, you know, taking the losses. They're all about capital appreciation and, uh, you know, the, the idea of a, of a corporation, of a limited liability company, it, it allows you to take advantage of the, um, the pass-throughs. It also is hugely flexible, and because of that flexibility, you end up with uh, less standardization across companies, and, and, and investors sometimes don't like that. They like to know what they're getting. They like to just, uh, you know, the, the, for corporations, there's, there's basically a, a standard set of documents that early stage companies um, put in place and, and, and you see a lot of companies across the board with these kind of similar provisions, whereas when you get involved with limited liability companies, you know, you really don't have any much standardization. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And also, um, Michael has on his side sort of considered the business model that we was talking about, that, that idea of, you know, think about what you're building, right? So you have your technology, you've dumped it into the company, all that kind of thing. What's your plan? What's your path? Are you going to raise venture capital, hire a sales, develop the technology, hire a sales force, et cetera? Um, or do you have a, a sort of a, a single invention that is going to be really valuable to somebody, but at the end of the day, what you really want to do is develop it to a point maybe with some bootstrapped capital, um, friends and family mo money, maybe some angel capital. You're going to raise a couple million dollars, and at that point, either sell it to somebody or maybe you're going to license it and take royalties over time. If, if that's your path, well, you're going to be a heck of a lot more, for all the reasons Mike said, a heck of a lot more efficient um, tax-wise to do the LLC. So um, I guess with that said, um, oh, yeah. Is there any room for a general partnership, or is that pretty much passe given the availability of an LLC? Is there any advantage of a, of a, or any disadvantage, apart from the obvious lack of any Do you want to take that one? Or? I, I don't think company, people set up, I mean, people do use general partnerships, but not for this type of, uh, this, this, this type of business. Yeah, the, the short answer is no, and, and, and at the end of the day, actually, so actually that's not a bad segue into the next piece, which is, so, so let's assume you're going to set up an entity, and it could be any kind of entity for, for the things we're, I'm going to talk about. It could be an LLC, it could be a, a corporation, it could be a general partnership, actually. Um, and there are different sets, different types of documents, different names of documents that you'd use to set these things up. I'm not going to get into those. I want to stay at the sort of conceptual level, um, but, but to sort of put a fine point on your question, you actually could start with a general partnership. Very simple. You, you, you agree to these concepts on a piece of paper. You both sign it. You have a partnership. Those are the terms of your partnership. And, and I say that not tongue-in-cheek or joking. Um, we've done those, um, and we've done it where 
people say, look, we want to take a run at this thing, but we don't know where it's going to go. Um, we have the basic terms of it together. We have $10,000, and we want to get going, and we don't want to give it to you. Um, so we say, okay, you do. They, they'll do a memo. Do you have to carry forward if you have a general partner? <coughs> You do, right? right? Or is it limited? It's, it's passed through. It's yeah, passed through. it's passed through entities. So, the, the, yeah, way to think about it is an LLC is taxed like a partnership because right. that's what came first. Yeah. So, um, but in any event, we, we've had people uh, put a put a memo together, hitting the high points of what they care about. They sign it and off they go, and uh, they've been turned into corporations later, and they've been <coughs> torn up later. So <laughs> it's it's not a crazy question. So in any event, uh, so so. You know, we, you're at the point where you're going to create something. We want to talk um, a little bit about what I call dividing the pie. So it's who, who gets what. Um, and it's actually one of the, the earliest tough tests for a management team, right? So let, let's sort of imagine three people coming together because with one person, you don't really need to do much. So we'll, we'll imagine three people coming together. The first thing is who, who gets what. And it's really, it, it's, uh, I'll, I'll start out by saying it's art, not science. Um, it's, it's a... Uh, question of balancing. Um, it'll be a negotiation. Um, ultimately, it's a valuation question. Okay, we're, we're actually not going to get into uh, uh, the fine points, sort of business school valuation. I think you're going to do that in a couple weeks when you talk about venture capital. Um, but but I think it's important to think about um, this first uh, th th this first question about who gets what in terms of value. Not not so much valuation, but it's that question of who's bringing what to the table. And you have to have an honest, frank conversation amongst the group and, and come to uh, some fair resolution. Again, you know, not science. It's going to be, well, I, I invented the thing, and I, I'm, I'm bringing a patent to the table, but I can't bring it forward without Scott's research that he's bringing to the table. Mike's going to actually raise us some money and make that happen. And so it, it's actually an exercise in valuing what you bring to the table, but also valuing and appreciating whatever everybody else does. I can't tell you how many times, we, that, that's at the outset. We also then, you're going to add people, and you're going to give them equity. Um, and we'll talk about how, how that happens. But I can't tell you how many times someone says, oh, I've got this guy. We've, you know, we, we've invented something. We're improving it. We've formed our entity. And now we've got this guy who says he's going to raise money for us. Um, what do those guys get, right? And so the answer is, well, I don't know. Let's talk about what you have. And it folds back into that question of value. And you think, think about it as the equity is a percentage of the ownership of the entity, and it has a value today. It's going to build value over time. And you can call it 1 million, 5 million, 10 million, 100 million. You have to think about what Mike's going to do. What is that worth to me, worth to me in today dollars? Imagine sort of hypothetical value of $2 million of, of today's value. Well, how much of that is it worth to have Mike do what he says he's going to do? And then come, come to that. You also run through in your mind, well, OK, now if I gave him that, and we ultimately sell this for $100 million, and uh, his 5% his has been diluted down, it's worth $2 million, you say, well, is that fair for the sort of risk he took and the effort he put in? If it seems fair to you, you do it, you're off, and you go. If it doesn't seem fair to you, you keep negotiating. But what you'll ultimately do is agree to what you agree to. Okay? Same thing for the founders and how you divide it. Um, when, once you've sort of got that set, you've decided who's going to own how much, you create the entity, and there's a set of issues that you're going to have to face or that you should face um, around control. I, I've sort of headed this founders agreement. Um, as I said before, there's a multitude of agreements that these could come up in called a shareholders agreement, a founders agreement, an operating agreement for an LLC, a uh, certificate of incorporation for a corporation. Call it what you will, you can find these issues in them. Um, and, and the way to think about this is, is the issue. So first one is voting. How are you, how are you going to vote? Why do you vote? So let's imagine uh, a hypothetical scenario where we, we've come together. I, I think I had said I, I brought the patent to the table. He brings some expertise. He's bringing some, some business savvy. Um, and so we've decided that it's going to be 60% owned by me, 20% by Scott, 20% by Mike. Well, out of the box, if all we do is create an entity, split up the equity that way, um, as a matter of economics, well, it flows through the percentages. But moving from the economics, 
then for decision making and control, the six, it's, it's majority rules. So I now get to make all the decisions. I get to elect the board. I get to decide whether we're going to allow more people in, the, the, the shape of the company, where it's going to go. And, and very often, you might, or not might, but very often you do not follow the value with the voting. So in, in this scenario, we might decide we're all actually going to make decisions together. I'm bringing some historical knowledge. Scott's bringing some new knowledge. Mike's bringing the whole business aspect to it. And so we might put a voting agreement in place that says we all agree to vote for each other as the board of directors for some period. Um, same idea, you could, we, we could split it 50, 25, 25. Same concept, that you, you could go without it because nobody controls, or you could also decide that you're going to vote based on some supermajority for, for certain things. Okay, it, it might be in, the, in this case that the supermajority is all three of us. Majority, you need any two of us, but we decide there may be some things like sale of the company that we'd actually want all three of us to be on the same page for. Um, there's, I could give you a thousand different sort of permutations and things to think about, the ones that I've already said in terms of major issues. Those are the things you're going to want to work through. Gee, do we want one of us to decide, two of us, all three of us? Um, and the one thing I guess I'll say on voting that you want to be a little bit careful about is uh, what I call sort of setting yourself up for holdouts. So that idea of all three agreeing is, is nice for a major uh, decision, but if you, you have a major decision facing you, um, sometimes you want to be able to say, you know what, if it makes sense to two of us, we're going to go ahead with it. Okay, so you just think about how you want to make decisions and then tailor the uh, the, the percentages and the voting to it. Um, did you want to say anything more about that? Well, I guess I would just, we'll get into later kind of decisions that are made uh, by the board of directors versus decisions made by the equity holders. Sometimes uh, on, the, on the voting, what Paul's talking about is kind of fundamental, you know, who goes on the board, when can you sell the company, you know, when can you modify it, it's kind of fundamental documents. And then later on in the presentation, we'll talk about kind of decisions that may that get made by the board of directors, and, and that has similar uh, implications with voting and, and control and, and percentages and things like that. Great. So uh, just sort of moving down, the next thing to think about are restrictions on transfer, and there there are some legal reasons which Scott will get to in the last bullet uh, for putting restrictions on the transfer, but net net. You want to think about this thing as really an illiquid investment, typically of your time, maybe some of your money. Um, and it's really the, the two of you, three of you, five of you coming together to do this thing. And the default is that nobody sells until everybody sells, that the restrictions on transfer are you can't sell. And you think about it, well, we go into business together. I don't necessarily want to find out that next week I'm in business with Frank. Right? I went into business with Scott. Frank's a good guy, but I don't know Frank. So, um, so that's, you put restrictions on transfer. You can't sell without my permission. Now you can moderate that to say, well, back to the voting, maybe you could sell so long as you convince some percentage of the other holders. Um, now I said it's an Ill illiquid investment. Well, li life is long and y you don't want to be tied into the thing forever. So we layer in what are called rights of first refusal. So essentially what that says is, okay, nobody can sell, but if you want to sell, then you have to offer, and, and you get an, uh, uh, an offer to sell, you have to then offer to everybody else in the, in the company or every other shareholder who has this right, uh, the ability to go ahead and, and sell, the, uh, excuse me, buy your shares. And it gives the, the rest of the guys the ability to say, okay, you know what, we get it, you want out, you want liquidity, you're worried about your gold coins, um, so we're going to let you go, but we don't want Frank in, we, he doesn't add what you add, so what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and whatever Frank was going to pay you, we'll buy you out for that. Um, there's something, and actually any questions about that? So flipping down the, the other side of that co coin is what we call a tag-along right, so that was the the, the right of first refusal was the ability to sort of regulate who we're, who we're in business with. By the same token, we may either not have the money, may not want to spend the money, we may like Frank and say, hey, yeah, let's, let's bring Frank in, you need some liquidity, Scott, but we'll say, but the tag-along right gives Mike and me 
the right to say, okay, tell you what, Frank's going to put in $100,000 for, was it 20% of the company? Um, I'm actually going to sell part of that, my pro rata share, my 60% of the 20%. Mike's going to sell his 20%, and he's going to sell his 20%. So we each get some liquidity. Scott maybe takes a passive role now. Frank's now in the company as our partner. So it's just, it's sort of, as I say, the other side of the coin. Um, the drag along rights, uh, I'll just briefly say about that, it, it is what it says. So it's the ability of some group, it could be 40% holders, could be 50%, 60%. It's, it, it's the ability of some group, and everybody agrees that when that group decides they're going to sell to a third party, everybody will go along with the sale. At the fact, same price. At the same price, same terms, et cetera. And that's that sort of avoiding holdups concept that I talked about that before we were talking about not giving somebody the right to block it. This is actually giving some subgroup the ability to actually sell the company, get liquidity, and everybody else has to come along. And then the final bit that I'll say under the Founders Agreement is to consider vesting, okay? And people often say, well, wait a minute. Why, if the three of us are getting together, why should we consider vesting? Isn't that what the VCs come and tell us we have to do? Why don't we just say, no, we, we own them and let the VCs ask. And the reason is, from, from the different scenarios I've been throwing out, some, somebody keeps leaving the company, right? And so we went through all that sort of torture to agree on what value we were each going to provide. And it's, in all the examples, it was something we were going to do, right? And maybe some of it got brought to the table. But at the end of the day, the real value we were going to build was going forward. So we, in order to protect, the people who stay from the downside of someone leaving and taking their equity with them, we put in place something called vesting. And that's the company's ability or the other founder's ability to buy out a departing shareholder at some nominal value, typically what they paid for the shares. Um, it's, it can be, there are different triggers. It's typically no longer providing services for the company. That's easy when you have an employee and they're either hired or they're fired. A little trickier when, when you have founders. One of the things that, that we found works is you go back to that concept, if there's three of you and two of you agree that the other one's not adding value and needs to go, well, then they're terminated, uh, the vesting stops, you, you have the right to buy back the unvested shares. Um, the other easy example is someone leaves, right? And you get to buy back the unvested shares. The other question is sort of how much do you get to buy back, right? And so there are lots of different uh, ways to skin the cat. Um, I'll talk about two. One is time-based vesting and the other is milestones. So time-based vesting says that your equity is subject to this right of repurchase over a period of time. Let's call it four years, it's sort of typical. And I didn't make that up. All the things we've been talking about, we're thinking about building a company over the course of four years, adding value over the course of four years. And so what, what the, the vesting would put in place is the ability of the company to buy back some portion of those shares depending on when you leave. So it'd be 25% each year over those four years. Now that can be modified. Typically maybe you have a 25% cliff, and then after that it flips to monthly or quarterly. All proxy for creating value. And if you think you can measure the creation of the value, you could do milestones, it doesn't have to be time. You could, we could agree that, you know, the issue of the patent is a milestone. When the patent issues, I get my shares vested. It could be some portion gets issued then. Um, when Mike raises the money, some portion of his shares could be vested. The only thing I'd sort of caution you with that is, you can dream up a whole lot of different milestones to put in place, and you can pay lawyers a lot of money to write them down and fine tune them and probably be wrong about them. So my, my default typically is you use time unless there's some clear, clear milestone that you really want to tie somebody to, that they've really committed to. Um, just, just the other thing on this whole vesting and the, and the, and the founders and getting together with other people. Um, although you can't really know for sure, you know, when you're getting together with, with, with other individuals and you have misgivings about somebody, you know, their problems, you know, you may want to uh, trust your gut and, you know, it's, it's a lot harder to kind of get out of a, a situation as much as, you know, we set up these um, uh, 
vesting schedules and and but you know w once you kind of go and start going down the path with somebody that that doesn't work and, and a lot of times people come in and out of companies and you can't do anything about it it's it's i mean you should expect it but if this if there's a real issue that you, you kind of just don't don't think that this person is really the right person to go into business with you know you, you may want to you know really uh give that give that feeling um some validation um so I'll just touch briefly on securities law issues. Um, just to know that when a company issues its securities, uh, stock, limited liability company interest, uh, certain amount, certain types of debt, um, those are deemed securities by the securities laws. And the way that the, the laws work is that the, the government requires you to either register your offering with the Securities and Exchange Commission and possibly uh, local states or find an exemption from registration. And they have something called a private placement exemption in lots of places, and this means, you know, you keep it to a small group of people who are sophisticated, or, you know, if it's just going to the founders, or if there are ways, of, you know, there's an exemption for issuing to employees or consultants. But just know that, you know, if, if you blow through and you don't, you don't pay attention to the requirements for uh, finding an exemption at, at the time you're an early stage company, uh, there could be some serious uh, uh, repercussions. You know, people could get a rescission right, which means that you actually have to give them back their money. Um, there could be fines. Uh, you know, if you uh, are trying to raise money from a venture capitalist and then they find out that you had all these problems with not complying with the securities laws when you, when you started out early, earlier in the company's history um, that can mess up your offering to, 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 to the VC. So, you know, it's, it's definitely an issue that is, is a complicated issue that you're going to want to have um, a, a competent attorney help you with uh, when you get to that point of issuing uh, securities to, um, to outside parties. Usually when you, when you issue the securities to the founders when you first start the company, that's not something necessarily that, that depending on the, you know, what's going on and, and how many different founders you have, but, you know, oftentimes just, just issuing the securities to the founders is not going to trigger, you know, major issues for you, but it's really kind of that next stage of granting securities to your employees or, or actually taking in investors that you really have to start paying attention to that. In terms of the type of equity securities that you can issue, uh, you have your standard in a, in a LLC, it's members membership units, it's a, it's a nomenclature issue. It's a similar to common stock in a C Corp. Uh, common stock is the uh, initial uh, issuance of securities. You can issue preferred beforehand, but typically most people uh, create the organization and issue a certain number of shares. Uh, the, typically, if you're going to create a company, Delaware is the choice because they have uh, a very good legal protection and it's really inexpensive to create a company in Delaware. A um, couple of things to think about in terms of preferred stock. Preferred stock is what it is, what's called, it's a preference. You get a higher preference than the common stockholders. Uh, typically it pays interest and you have voting rights generally in block with, uh, with the common. You can't necessarily vote against the common. You have to go vote in, con in connection with them. Um, it can be redeemable, so it's more akin to convertible debt. In, in essence, what you do is you'll have somebody come in and say, I'll put preferred stock in, and it's convertible at an IPO or seven years, in which case you're basically saying you have seven years to make it or else we want our money back. Most times it gets converted uh, prior to then, uh, either into an IPO or a secondary round comes in, and they will want a higher preference than the current people. In terms of uh, redeemable debt, uh, something to consider. Typically, it's debt with interest, and they usually throw in some sort of security uh, as a sweetener or, or what they call a kicker. That is the warrant. That warrant is, has value. It's additional interest, effectively. So if your stated interest rate is 5%, the value of that warrant gets added on top of that in accounting, in accounting terms because, in effect, you're giving more to get that cash. Um, speaking about warrants and stock options, uh, warrants are typically an equity security to buy common stock, but it can also be issued or granted in connection with a preferred offering, 
and it can be either convertible into additional preferred shares or common stock. So you have to be very careful how the characterization of that equity issu issuance is. In terms of uh, stock options, you have two kinds, incentive stock options and non-qualifieds. The difference is primarily how the tax treatment is for you as an individual recipient. It's an incentive for you to work at the company. It can be granted to officers, employees, and directors. Incentive stock options cannot be con granted to consultants. However, uh, non-qualifieds can. Incentive stock options has a tax benefit as opposed uh, that uh, is uh, primarily geared toward uh, the, the individual who's the recipient. That tax benefit is you don't pay any taxes until you exercise. You get capital gain treatment on the exercise price, anything, the amounts above the exercise price. So I'll give you an example. I grant to you an, an incentive stock option for a dollar. You turn around and you exercise it two years later for three dollars. You get capital appreciation on the, the, the two dollar difference between a dollar and three. However, you have to hold it for uh, six months to a year to get long-term capital gain. I think it's one year to get capital gain treatment. Otherwise, it's ordinary income. The company does not get a tax benefit for that. For non-qualified, it's reverse. The company gets a tax deduction for that. When you exercise it, you now get income to you for the difference from what you paid for the dollar and what the fair value is, and assuming it's $3, you'd have to get, inc you'd get income on $2 above that. And that would be ordinary income directly to you. However, when you sell it, anything above that would be capital gains, and you don't have to worry about the holding period. So there is specific benefits for, for these two types of uh, um, securities. Let me, let me just, uh, just, just basically, I, we may have gone, I think maybe going a little too fast on the whole idea of what a stock option is and when companies companies actually use these. Um, you know, st startup companies, obviously, cash is king. There's, there's very little of it. And the way that they incentivize their employees is a combination of uh, paying them a salary and granting them some kind of interest in the company. And, and oftentimes, for startup companies, it's done through what's called a stock option. That's what we've been talking about. And it's basically you're granted um, uh, a security, but it, you're, you don't really have much besides a piece of paper to start with, and it's basically the right to purchase the shares at a certain price. And the way it works is these days you have to grant the, um, the, the exercise price, your purchase price for those shares, is the fair market value on the date that you're granted that right. And typically you'll have 10 years to exercise that stock option, and so companies use this as a way to incentivize the employees to help the companies you know, increase its value because your value, you don't have any value if the company never appreciates a value because your value, you're getting in based on whatever the current value is. So the only appreciation you're ever going to get is if you and, and the other employees kind of band together and help get the company's value higher. And so that's, that's, that's the, you know, incentive part of it. It's also, you know, a retention tool um, because as, as we talked about for founders vesting, these options also, you don't, you don't get everything up front, you'll have it vested over time. And so, you know, uh, Paul, Paul used the term cliff vesting. So oftentimes you'll see employees where they'll, they'll get, you know, say you get 100 stock options with 25% will cliff vest. That means like after a certain period of time, maybe a year, you'll get that first 25% and you can exercise or just hold on to it, but know that those are gonna be your stock options. And then maybe after that, the, the next 75% will vest monthly uh, pro rata over the next three years. So, so this, this whole idea of, of, of stock options is really sort of, a, kind of a combination of incentive and retention tool for startup companies, and, and, and mature public companies use them, use them as well, but it's really, um, it really supplements the, and gives the, you know, I think it attracts a lot, of, uh, a lot of entrepreneurial people into the enterprise because they really see a huge upside if they can, uh, you know, help this company, you know, create, create value. This is, you know, it's, it's all leverage because you actually don't have uh, other than your time and effort, you're not risking money at the beginning to get the stock option. You, you just kind of ride and, and then exercise when, when there's actually value. <clears throat> uh, 
In regards to how you value those securities is very important. Um, in, in the example that they gave was if, if you have to earn your restricted stock over a period of time, there's tax consequences relating to that. And there's certain tools that are available to the, to the individuals that can minimize their tax exposure. One of them is an 83B election. What that is, is if you, exercise, if you file the A3B election, which is, it's not really necessarily a form, but there's certain information that you include on a statement that you send to the IRS saying, here's my name, here's the number of securities, this is how much I paid for, and a few other pieces of information. What that provides is you're, you're accepting compensation up front. So by way of an example, as a founder, you come in and you say, I want to keep him here for four years we're going to let it vest over four years. So initially, the stock is at a penny per share on day one. If you file an 83B election, effectively, it's whatever those shares that you're going to grant to them, it'll be that number of shares times a penny. That's what compensation he'll pick up immediately. And what that does is you're basically taking a risk that if the company goes nowhere, you picked up income, paper income, and you pay tax on it. However, if you don't execute an 83B election, each time something vests, you need to fair value that, that stock option or that stock grant, and you're going to pick up compensation based on that difference. So if you lock it in at a penny, it's great for you. If you don't and the stock goes up to a dollar, it'll be 99 cents times the number of shares that vested. And each year or each time it vests, you're going to pick up compensation. So it's, it, it's a, it can be very... Um, disastrous for you as an individual if you don't ex ex execute that election. The risk is that you execute it and the company doesn't go anywhere and you pick up income. So in the terms of uh, restricted stock, earning it in to keep people incentivized and want to keep them there for a long time, or at least not having to pay them out, each time if uh, venture capital comes in, they're going to want to say, we're going to want you to re-earn those shares. The price then is $3 and you do an 83B election, there's no, there's no gain or loss because the fair value of the stock is $3 and what you're paying for is $3. And any appreciation is effectively uh, is going to be capital gains when you sell. But if you don't elect it, you're going to get that variableness and you're going to end up getting, having to pay taxes on income or, or cash you never received. That's the, the, the benefit of the 83B election. It's a risk that you're, you're saying, I'm going to own something and it's going to be valuable in the future. The other side of that is a 409A. 409A valuation basically provides the support for the fair value of the underlying securities. In an early stage company, there's very little value in the company and it's, it's not required that you get a 409A valuation done. Uh, usually a 409A valuation is done when you have a, a uh, an event that happens within a company, venture capital, um, the granting of a patent. Those are the kind of events that establish value in your company. And I'll explain to you why that's important that the 409A valuation is done at around that period of time. When you grant options or, or warrants or any equity securities to an individual, it's an individual issue because you're going to get it and you're going to exercise it. When you exercise it and you claim capital gain treatment at the individual level, the IRS may challenge it. And if the IRS challenges it and he comes back and they say, we disagree with your valuation, it's onerous on your part. Because A, now you have to pay ordinary income on what you thought was capital gains. B, it opens up prior year returns. And C, they come back and they, they go after anybody else in the company because you didn't do a proper valuation study. There's three ways that you can do a study. The old, the old way was the board gets internal projections from their CFO, values the company, and says, okay, it's, it's worth three cents a share now based on our internal metrics, whether it's uh, a patent or, or comparable companies that they, they're, they're looking at. That's a high, highly risky because the IRS can challenge those assumptions, and again, you get the onerous uh, tax results from an individual. Two, you can do it internally where you have your CFO or some competent individual within the organization perform a valuation study, 
prepare the whole docket and then say this is the support that why we think the value of the company is five cents a share. The IRS takes a view on that, that it has to be somebody who has significant knowledge and experience in pre preparing and providing 409A valuations. So it just can't simply be done on the back of an envelope. It has to have some sort of meaning. Otherwise, again, they disallow it. The er third way is to go out and get an appraisal done by an in independent valuation company. Uh, using an internal projection, uh, internal created one or using an external uh, sh basically shifts the burden of proof on the IRS to say that it is not reasonable and it's a high burden for them to cross. Relying on the board getting some internal pre prepared uh, projections is not going to pass muster. So while we say at the early stages you don't really need it, but when you start granting stock options and warrants and things of that nature, or restricted stock, a 409A evaluation done at least a minimum once a year will be suitable to support the, the, the value of the company. Uh, typically, you're going to grant options throughout the year. Uh, what we have encouraged our, our clients to do is cluster them around certain things, such as the annual meeting, where discussions of the value of the company, where the company is going for, going to, and what, and what direction it's going and, and what has occurred in the past 12 months and get a value around that date, because that's typically when the board is going to approve next year's option grants. Question? I don't know if you were to talk more about that, but can, can you maybe talk to when uh, founders should be thinking about issuing stock versus options to their other people, and what are the, the puts and takes of, of each of those? Sure. I'll start it and if you feel uh, options typically are granted to employees stock is more granted to people who you want to keep around longer uh, think of it this way if I'm an employee and I'm the controller granting me stock now I own a piece of the company and I'm if I leave I still own a piece of the company by granting me an option if I leave and it's not vested, I lose it. But once you grant it, I'm, I'm, I'm an owner. And as he goes back, to, as they were saying, to get me out, because now I'm part of the company, most companies will say, look, uh, how do we buy them out? And uh, I guess you want to. Well, I, I think you, you could also do restricted stock, and then you have vesting mm -hmm. for the shares. Uh, the problem is, as a company's value increases when you make the grant of stock, and this is what, what Mike was talking about earlier, there is, there is a value to that and there's income at that particular time. So if, you're, if a company has a, a meaningful value and you're getting a, a, a stock grant, um, you're going to have to pay taxes at that time on the grant of the shares, mm -hmm. whereas the option itself, being granted the option, does not Still trigger is. a tax. At that, at that particular time. And then the whole issue with the appreciation and the vesting, that's where the whole uh, 83B election comes in, where, you know, you could pay all the tax. You, if, if the company actually does increase in value, your lowest tax uh, is going to be at the time that the shares are granted, if you have the, if you have the cash to pay it. Um, but you could also get burned and, and pay all the taxes up front, and then the, the, the valuation could come down, and then, and then you wouldn't have. But, but otherwise, you know, if you, if you don't do the 83B election and then you have to pay taxes each time there's vesting and, you know, there's no liquidity event, you're basically triggering a tax at a later time at a higher value without the cash necessarily to pay the tax. So uh, that's why I think as, as companies progress in their valuation, you tend to see stock options. Um, and then I, there's some things called restricted stock units that are, that are sort of a, a, in between the stock options, and, but those are typically more mature companies get involved with, uh, with those types of grants. Uh, just a couple of thoughts on the, uh, if you, you get challenged by the IRS at the individual level. Not only do you have to go back and pay taxes at ordinary income and penalties and interest along with paying a, uh, your accountant to re refile those returns, there's a 20% penalty on top of it. And that's, that's the onerous part of it. So if you're in a position where they determine that the, your, your process was not appropriate, it's, it's, it's horrendous. Uh, and the, the other side of it is, is that when you're, when you're looking to do this, 
it, it could invalidate incentive stock options because they're typically supposed to be only granted at fair market value. So now you blow your incentive stock option, you make them non-qualified, which then changes the whole purpose of structuring the transaction to get the most tax advantageous position for those individuals. So there's a ripple effect that goes through the company. So it's not just simply a one-person issue, it, it just uh, it permeates throughout the organization. And that's why it's very critical that you, uh, when the IRS changed those rules several years ago, that you consider how you're valuing your company. Because too, far too often people were saying, oh yeah, my stock is only worth a nickel. And you have you know, half a million dollars in net income. It doesn't make sense. And their view is you're giving them cheap stock. And cheap stock is a bad thing in terms of the IRS. Because they, you, you, they want you to pay at normal, capital, at normal ordinary rates as opposed to capital gain rates. We'll talk a little bit about uh, good corporate records. Uh, two reasons for it. One is, if you want somebody to buy your company, you want to be able to present to them the best possible picture of your company. And if they walk in and they're doing due diligence and you can't produce good books and records, it's going to affect your valuation and, and what they buy a company from you. Secondly, it subjects yourself that if you were audited by the IRS, those deductions would not be uh, um, accepted because you can't document them. Let me, let me just throw out uh, a third, and that's um, there's this uh, ominous phrase called piercing the corporate veil, whereas if you don't keep separate books from the company, so you kind of mix your checking account with the company's checking account, and you don't keep separate uh, you know, documenting contracts and everything signed in your personal name, then, you know, the, the thing we talked about, about protecting yourself from liability, you may have problems with that later on if the, you know, because the, um, if you get sued, the court may not give any weight to the actual entity because you didn't operate it as a separate entity. So that's, that's just a third consideration that, you know, from early on, from day one, you set up a company, you want to, you get your tax ID number, you want to have a separate bank account for that, for that entity, keep it completely separate from your own funds, uh, keep, keep good records of, of your expenses, the company's expenses, um, you know, uh, document the actions taken by the company, the board of directors, the stockholders, and just make sure that uh, everything, you know, can establish that you have this separate entity that's, that's a different entity from you so that if there's ever trouble down the road, you don't have to worry about your own assets being, being on the line. You have some availability uh, in the current environment to utilize cloud services. Uh, the only question I have is if you're going to put your information in the cloud, make sure you have a backup somewhere else that is accessible. If you happen to not pay a bill, you may not be able to get access to your books and records. So if you're using an online service like from Quicken or QuickBooks, just make sure that you do have a, a downloaded copy in the event that for whatever reason you can't access it either through non-payment or or uh, accessibility through their website. Uh, just be careful about that. Uh, the other aspect of, of good corporate books and records is, are they auditable? Because at some point when you have somebody coming in to buy your company or invest in your company, they're going to want an accounting of what happened to date. And one of the best things you can hand to them is an audited report or review report, which is lesser in scope. The point being is somebody else looked at your books and records and they're in a prescribed format that somebody can look and evaluate. Uh, handing them a, a, a QuickBooks file, A, exposes them to everything that went on in your books and records. So if you have something that is um, characterized as saying miscellaneous expense, maybe they won't ignore it. However, if it's something that is maybe uh, uh, your Amex bill and they see that you're running through personal expenses through your Amex bill, that would be a negative thing that they would view. Uh, and that's again going back to keeping separate books and records. Uh, support for your expenditures. Uh, the Amex bill is not appropriate. It's the actual invoices that you're using. So if you're buying a computer through Amex, make sure you get the, uh, the Dell invoice also. That's the support, not, not a summary statement from American Express. Mike, just, just a quick question on that. So so with that said, when's a good time, so these guys are getting their company, mm -hmm. when's a good time to kind of get you guys involved? Okay. Or, or an account, doesn't that okay. be a... Well, the best time is when you form, format, 
for formalize an entity, whether it's an LLC or a C Corp or a partnership, you have tax reporting responsibilities. Typically, that's much more complex than uh, your individual personal return. So that would be a good introduction for, for an accounting person to come in or, or, or a tax advisor. They will help you, A, there's certain elections that you need to make on your tax return, uh, something simple as whether you're cash or accrual, whether you want to have a fiscal year end or a calendar year end. You're not obligated to use 1231. If you start your company on June 15th, you can say, I want June 30th to be my year end. All it's saying is you have to file a tax return within three and a half months or an extension and then file. If by not having good advice, there's some things you just can't unwind. And, you know, uh, or you end up spending a lot of money on attorneys to try and work around a problem that could have been easily fixed uh, so early on. It's a bad thing. Well, it can be. <laughs> Uh, some other things, uh, you know, your capital structure should be appropriate for the size of your organization. Uh, and there's, there's a couple of reasons for it. One is, it's nice to say I have a million shares issued to me, but if you really don't need a million shares, a thousand is probably more appropriate for your size of your organization. If you incorporate in Delaware, they have a franchise tax based on the number of shares outstanding. So. Um, and it's, it's a graduated tier. The more shares you have standing, the more costly it becomes. Uh, so why have to pay $750 or $1,000 when you can pay $250 and be perfectly fine? Um, accounting software. Uh, I've audited companies with Excel. I don't recommend it. Uh, I prefer that you have at least some basic accounting package that can extract the information and, and, and present uh, a, a, a balancing trial balance. Uh, there's software you can buy for under 200 bucks. Uh, you can go online and do a cloud-based approach where you pay a monthly fee. Uh, it really depends on your, your, your budgets and your, and your ability to fund the entity, uh, whether you want to have it paid up front or paid over, over every month. One critical area on payroll responsibilities. Uh, as the owner of the company, if you're going to be signing the 941s, uh, unless you, until you get somebody else who's going to take that responsibility, you have 100% liability on payroll taxes. So if you don't pay it, you're personally responsible for it, and there's a 100% penalty. Uncle Sam wants his money. Uh, you know, I jokingly say don't pay Con Ed or pay your rent, but pay Uncle Sam. Uh, so uh, just very critical. Payroll responsibilities, it's very complex. Uh, that's why ADP, Paychex, and CompuPay all have a business. They make it easy and inexpensive to comply with the state and federal tax laws. Uh, in essence, what they'll do is they'll extract the money from your account two days before and then wire the money out or pay, distribute the checks to your employees. Because they're taking all payroll responsibilities on filing and making sure your deposit's on time. Uh, I strongly encourage that when you have employees that that's the way to go. Um, most accounting firms do not do payroll in-house anymore. It's just not cost effective. Uh, in terms of funding sources, uh, you have friends and family, your own personal wealth. You can go out and get uh, angel capital, uh, private equity, and, and series A, B, and C rounds uh, as you progress up the scale. Um, understand that they have their own use. They're not, nothing derogatory about it. It's just, it's a natural progression of the company. However, again, it's a good introduction to speak to an accounting firm and your attorneys before you sign an agreement. So you understand what your rights and responsibilities are and also what you're giving up. To touch upon uh, budgets and forecasting, um, Budgets are a tool, not a means to an end. Uh, your business, you use the budget to manage your business. There's opportunity costs within your budget, uh, but there's also fixed costs. So the, the timing of hiring a research scientist when you're ready to do that may happen in May, may happen in December. Um, but the opportunity to buy a fixed asset, such as a, 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 a medical device 
tool or, or, or a stethoscope, not a stethoscope, but I'm, a, a, um, I'm trying to think of a good example, uh, a, a microscope that may cost two or $3,000. You may defer when you hire that person, but you need that scope now. Uh, it doesn't necessarily happen $500 every month. It may happen immediately or it may happen six months from now. But the, the idea of a budget is to help you understand where you're going to go with your business given the limited resources that you have. And I, I strongly encourage you from looking at budgets and forecasts, take, consider how much things cost. Um, far too often I'll see somebody put down rent, you know, $4,000. Um, unless you're in an incubator, it's not going to cost you $4,000 a year. Uh, you can probably find out how much the, uh, what you need to run your, your, your uh, internal research on terms of buying equipment. Um, but, you know, I see line items for $1,000 for accounting fees. I'm like, well, that may get your tax return filed. Um, bootstrapping is, is, is good, but again, you get what you pay for, and if you want somebody to make a, a mistake, there, there are areas where it's going to come into play. And you hate, the last thing you want to do is have a budget that you've budgeted only, say, $2,000 for, and you find out it really costs eight, because then it totally destroys what you're looking to do. So speak to us or speak to your accountants. We've seen enough budgets, and we can say these are the things you're missing, and we can help you out in terms of giving you a little bit thought on what the pricing of, of the true costs are. Uh, I guess a perfect example would be internet. Uh, it's easy. You get it at home and you get it here at the, at the school and the, uh, the hospital. But when you go out and you actually have a business, you have to pay for it yourself. And it's not $175 with uh, HBO included. It's more like $750 and, or more, depending on how much bandwidth. These are real costs and they, when you graduate from an incubator up to uh, having space, there's a lot of other costs that get filtered into it that you have been sheltered unless you've run, already run a company. You want to squeeze in? So I, I talked to Marissa, she said uh, take as much time as we want, so I think we've only got about 90 minutes left, so just joking. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we're going to wrap up by 7. So. Mike, why don't you just, I guess, um, we get this last, second yeah, to last I'll, slide I'll, I'll on tax considerations. Yes. When you actually incorporate the business or file as an LLC, you now trigger tax reporting requirements. Um, you get to elect a fiscal year and determine whether you want cash or accrual. One critical thing that typically uh, is, is a problem for startups is employee versus independent contractor or W-2 versus 1099 if you want to think of it that way. Uh, the IRS has 21 tests to determine what you are and they mostly all lean toward employee. Uh, you got to be very careful in the early stages a lot of times you'll do you'll hire somebody uh, research scientist and say okay I'll 1099. However if you control what they do they're actually employees and now the company is subject to uh, withholding taxes and FICA uh, taxes. Again, the IRS loves to come back and look at that. Uh, early stage companies, not so much, but when you get to a certain point, they will be looking at it. Um, you get a, if I can make a quick comment on that from a legal perspective, 100% uh, right. Uh, it, it, the, the, you know, it, it leans to If you think they're uh, an independent contractor, they're an employee. Um, but but from, from, from the other side of it, too, talking about building value, and we talked about all that. Often at the early stage, they will actually qualify as an independent contractor because you don't have space, they're using their own laptops, etc. You need to think through on that side of it to make sure that, notwithstanding that they're an independent contractor, you as a company have the right to all the work they have that's stored on their laptop, their home computer, and you want agreements in place, typically of proprietary <coughs> information, inventions, assignment. You may have signed them for employers. You may have hated to sign it for your employer, but make sure you have your employees sign them um, and your independent contractor. So. And lastly, we'll talk about tax incentives and credits. Um, R&D credits are available for uh, medical uh, research and R&D and companies in the life sciences practice area. 
Uh, there's another concept called enterprise zones. Within the New York City area, they're, they're, uh, they're, they have a few. One is in Dumbo, which is uh, across in, in Brooklyn. Uh, and they had some good, actually good cash refunds. For every employee you hired, you got up to $6,500 back. And that worked out great for one of my technology clients uh, who averaged around $600,000 a year uh, coming from the state when they needed it. So it can help fund your, uh, your business. Um, expensing of equipment purchases, you have the option of, of uh, expensing it immediately and getting a tax deduction or straight lining it over the estimated life, which is depending on the property, five or seven years. And there's state incentives also. So that's a, that's a good area to understand where you, can inter where you can speak to your tax accountant, what is available so that you can actually properly document it and be able to utilize it going forward, because some of them can be cash grants back. Uh, one, one critical area, aspect of, of, in, of these incentives, you have to have them well documented. And you can't go back and try and recreate something in conversations three years ago. Uh, when you go to, to actually utilize them, the IRS typically likes to challenge them. And they want to see that you have them properly documented. If you do it as you're going, it's, it's, it's contemporaneous evidence and the IRS is least likely to, ch to at least prevail in that kind of argument. If you go back and say, okay, let's look back five years, people have come and gone, records are not quite in order, and you end up losing the deduction. So that's wasted money or wasted tax credits that somebody is looking at them uh, down the road. So just keep that in mind. All right, so we're down to the last slide. Um, start with uh, just the board of directors. We mentioned that these are uh, the individuals that are responsible for basically the oversight of the, of the corporation um, or, or the limited liability company. Um, they're, they're elected by the stockholders or the members, typically for a term, you know, one year. Um, and, and their responsibilities are basically strategic direction and making the material decisions that affect the, the, the company. Uh, they'll delegate the day-to-day -day operating decisions to, uh, to management. And uh, both the officers and the directors have uh, duties to the equity holders and to the company. They're, they're called fiduciary duties. The two principal ones are uh, the duty of care and the duty of loyalty. Duty of care requires you to uh, basically requires directors to um, you know, have a robust discussion and, and have an understanding of what it is actually that they're, they're, they're going to approve to fulfill that duty. The duty of loyalty is basically requires the directors to put the company ahead of their own personal interests. So, you know, they can't be self-dealing transactions unless, uh, I mean, they're not prohibited, but if you're going to, if a director is going to enter into a transaction with a company, it needs to be fair. Um, th these, these issues uh, come up with uh, corporate opportunities also. If you're a director of a company and you learn about an opportunity, you have a duty to bring that first to the company to see if uh, it wants to take advantage of that opportunity. If it doesn't, then, um, then you can pursue it on your own. And I guess I'll, I'll just let Paul wrap up with uh, the Board of Advisors. Sure. And, and I guess uh, all I'd say there, too, is le lest you think it doesn't apply to you, um, you know, you, even at an early stage, if you take somebody else's money and you're the board, you're it. You have two members of the board, you're still it. So it, it applies. And you should think about this from day one, I think, um, because it adds discipline to what you're doing that's very helpful. Um, I'll, I'll talk about a board of advisors briefly. And, and you know, board of advisors, board of directors, the, the more formal thing, as Scott says, the board of directors. People often put board of, boards of advisors together, often to have some names they can stick into their fundraising materials. Um, and that's fine. But the more useful thing, it, it, particularly, you know, you're the sole director. You and your partner are the directors. You don't really need other directors. I actually am a fan of bringing in a third party. Um, whether they bring money or not adds discipline to the thing. I'm a fan of monthly meetings, not quarterly, even early on, especially early on. Again, deadlines, deadlines. Um, board of advisors, I'd use them the same way. If they're willing to give you some advice, okay, it's great to have their name on a slide, but more importantly, think about them as your board of directors. Treat them that way. Think about that duty of care, okay, and hold meetings. Schedule them. Have an agenda. Okay, give them materials for the meetings. Give them the materials a week before if you can. 
okay? All that would be sort of important to fulfilling your duty of care and your fiduciary duties, but it's most important to actually getting the most out of those people. They've agreed to help you, so kind of help them help you is, is what I'd say. Um, ultimately, I'll, I'll stop there. I think we said we'd do questions. I don't know if you have them. Okay, I see some, some nodding, so we'll, we'll, we'll leave time for some questions um, with that. And I see one in the front row yes. about general partnerships, right? I have a question about the, the liability of the board of directors. Let, let's yep. say you're on the board of directors, um, and it turns out that the science behind this was fraudulent. You know, there's a couple of fairly large, um, I'm sure you've heard, you know, in my own field, reproduction mm -hmm. claims about stem cells and making eggs out of both. And then you're on the board, and all of a sudden, it turns out this person made this up. Um, and now, normally, there's a scientific impact. share in that. So, so you weren't a scientist, you sort of accepted for fact the guy published in Nature, you assumed that they would review it objectively, and it turns out he just made it up or he had, you know, kind of a, an optimist view. So, so what's so, the responsibility of the board and, and what kind of financial implications are there apart from the ethical and moral? And well, I, I, would, I would start out by saying that, um, you know, in Delaware, um, basically a corporation can in, um, can write into their uh, certificate of incorporation for a company that the directors are not liable um, for obligations other than for you know certain certain very uh, you know uh, problematic things like if they breach their duty of loyalty so they engage in septal intrinsecal. So your example, uh, as a general matter, the directors weren't operating in bad faith. They didn't. I mean, they have a duty of oversight, but they didn't know they were. They they thought it was legitimate science. Um, and it turned out that it wasn't. So ultimately, the company can, can stand up and defend them. But again, you have to look at, well, what's the company? If it's just a startup shell without any assets, without any cash, and you're going to get sued by somebody, um, you know, you, you really could potentially have, have an issue. So you, know, you want to look at, look at companies, um, even though you know, as, as a legal matter, ultimately, you may not be responsible. You know, you're still going to have uh, you know a, a litigation on your hands to defend. So you know that's what the directors and officers liability insurance is for, and that's why you know you see the company people are reluctant to sign on to boards of directors unless the company actually has some some assets to to, to protect itself. Um,